Jack, welcome back to Yerevan and thank you for joining me on Mindful Leaders. It's been a pleasure. Yeah. Okay. I wish to highlight that the conversation we're having today is actually has been inaugurated as the Euregion Family Studio thanks to your generous contribution to CivilNet. So on behalf of CivilNet management and the CivilNet team, I want to thank you so much for being such a support to CivilNet. I'm very, very happy to do that and seeing what you have here, it's amazing, you know. You have an amazing group up there. I'm very proud of you guys. Thank you, yeah. thank you. I never imagined 30, 40 years ago when I went up with our meeting in his studio, you know, 40 years later. In Yerevan. Yes, in Yerevan, yeah, of all places, <laughs> yeah. So, um, as a major philanthropist, you and your family have played a, an enormous um, role or played an important part uh, in supporting organizations around the world, including in Armenia, uh, primarily in education, among others, but uh, I think of COAF, where you've established a scholarship fund. Um, I think about American University of Armenia, I think about the Armenian Relief Society, Home and Men, and many other more organizations like this. Um, and like I said, primarily in the areas of education, whether it's higher education, children's education. Why have you been so devoted to education? You know, we're living in an age right now where it's very challenging uh, for the youth, you know, to survive their life now. Uh, with all the computer age, you know, the computer games, you know, they need to have somebody to give them a new direction in life, to keep them busy, you know, away from their computer uh, toys that they get so addicted to. And there are different ways you can make a difference in kids' life. You know, it could be educational, it could be different ways. You know, I, I bring up home men, you know. Uh, I've been home men, colleague and scout when I was back in Jerusalem. They do an amazing job, you know, uh, building this kid's uh, character, you know, get them into sports, get their minds off uh, uh, their early challenging years. And uh, it's, it's commendable, you know, and that's what we need right now. Uh, ARS does an amazing work in Los Angeles and around the world, you know. I mean, they have uh, uh, branches all over the world. And <laughs> um, my wife has been a member of their chap one of their chapters for quite a few years. So she, uh, that's one organization. That, and I'm very supportive as well also. And they have wonderful volunteers there. They. In fact, we have their banquet this uh, next Sunday. And the Sunday after is the banquet for American Armenian Museum. Uh, so, uh, it just comes from, my, from the heart, you know. I mean, if it doesn't come from the heart, it's hard to do it. But, uh, and I have a supportive family. I have a supportive wife that support me sometimes. I don't tell her everything, and then you know she sees a picture in the newspaper, and she asks me, "How soon to work on the beer?" So she finds out from the public, yeah. obviously, uh, eventually. <laughs> you uh, talking about education? Um, I recall you telling me that when you were very young, you had a passion for medicinal chemistry, and then um, obviously your family had, you know, did not have the means to send you for an education, so you received a scholarship from the Gudbenkian Foundation. Well, when correct? I applied to the Gudbenkian Foundation, I told them that my major is medicinal chemistry. Right. They told me that they don't have any scholarships for medicinal chemistry, and they said the only scholarships they have is for pharmacy school. And I said, if I don't study medicinal chemistry, I have to go back to Jerusalem, probably do some teaching, you know, in high school or something. I might as well take the pharmacy school. And that's how it started, you know. So then uh, you, you started your education at AUB in Lebanon. Exactly. Yeah. And then continued at USC in California, where you received your doctoral degree in pharmaceutical studies. If uh, I, I have to, uh, I don't know if I've told you this part to you, but I have to tell you this, you know. It's so much important part of my life because I applied to USC from when I was at AUB, and they accept me back to first year pharmacy school. Mm -hmm. I said, I'm not going to go to first year. So I went to Los Angeles to visit my parents, and I was prepared to go back to Lebanon, finish my pharmacy school there. 
And some, somebody said, go see if you can meet the dean and talk to him. So I went, I called him and he was so nice to me, like he knew me from years ago, you know. He said, sure, come over, I'll meet you for 10 minutes. So I went there, have I told you this part? No. No, okay, so I went there to see him. I told him my situation. As I was talking to him, some young guy walked in, about 26, 27 years old. He was his research assistant. He was Armenian and he was from AUB. Mm. He pulled out a stick on pad, just right there, without even telling me anything. He wrote my name and I said, what is this guy doing, you know? Without talking to me, he just put up, pulled out a stick on pad, put my name on it. He said, take this to admissions office. You are accept third year pharmacy school, go and register. Wow. It's like, wow, you know, it just was amazing, you know. I wish I had that stick on pad, I would have put it in my bedroom, my office, <laughs> everywhere, you know. That really changed me because, you know, I didn't have to go back. And if I had to go back, I had to come back to USC and finish my education. That saved me like two years of education, plus gave me a good venue for my studies, you know. Of course. And, and you've had many of these serendipitous yeah. opportunities. And then I called, I, I wrote a letter to Gulbengi and I said, listen guys, you know, I told you I'm going back to UB, but this is what happened. They accept me to USC, third year pharmacy school. Uh, and they wrote me back and they said, no problem. We'll transfer to your scholarship to USC. And that's what they did, you know. Which is where yeah. after, after you uh, completed your studies, you worked in a pharmacy. I mean, you had other business ventures. We won't go into detail, but you uh, started off as a pharmacist. And I recall this particular story, which was very interesting. Um, after a while of working in this pharmacy, there was an opening for the chief pharmacist. I was the assistant chief pharmacist. Right. And so there was the opening for the position of chief, chief pharmacist, pharmacist, and you had applied for it. But lo and behold, they select a candidate from outside exactly, the pharmacy. Yeah. Um, you give them a notice, you leave, you quit. At that time, you were just newly married, you had your first child, no necessary stable income, and you decide, um, and we won't go into the details, but the, you decide to open your pharmacy. One pharmacy leads to three, to five. Uh, you expand your business um, and your company, not just in pharmacy, but also in medical and pharmaceutical supplies. Basically, you become the successful entrepreneur you are today. And I'm looking back, I'm thinking, had you been accepted I would have as a that. chief pharmacist, <laughs> where would you be today? I, I would have been still at the hospital working as, you know, because I won't know any better. And when I went home to tell my wife, I never forget, she was sitting there outside with a new baby in her lap. And I told her, babe, I just quit. And she went hysterical. She said, how can you do that? We just bought a new house. Right. We have a new baby. How are we going to survive? How are we going to live? And that takes a lot of courage and, and, and risk-taking guts. I'm just thinking, for instance, um, you know, we were talking about, um, you know, fate. Um, tell me, do you, how do you explain the turn of events in your life? Is it because of, you know, you really visualizing your dreams and manifesting your dreams? How do you explain that? You know, I had my dreams. I had my life like an architect would do. I had planned my life, except I didn't put it on paper. Things happened through my life, different things. You know, like I told you about how I met my wife. I'm going to tell you this part of my life that I have never told you. I, I, I haven't told anybody about this. My wife lived in a neighborhood called Tuluk Lake, which is right next to the studios. I don't know if you know about that area. It's a very charming area. So my wife didn't know anybody, so I had to live there. So my wife would have her sister there. They can go shopping together. And then six months later, we bought a house. We bought in the same neighborhood. I bought Walt Disney's parents' house by chance for $60,000, you know, and... Yes, you told me the story. I told I you, recall, and, you know, recall. keep telling. And uh, it was like magical, you know, and I remember the real estate agent taking me from the back door. I saw the swimming pool and I said, stop, I'm gonna put the offer. The guy probably thought I was crazy. He says, you know, you haven't seen the house yet. I said, I don't have to see it. I saw the pool. <laughs> 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 but anyway, that house, Has I been still a blessing. have it. Has been a blessing. My daughter lives there. I don't want to tell all, but I opened five pharmacies just from that one house. My daughter bought her building 20,000 square feet from that house. You know, it just has been like a blessing to my family. Uh, and it's very important part of, you know, achieving, you know, you know, fulfilling my dreams, you know, because, you know, it helped me a lot, you know. Of course, of uh, course, of course. I think of 
You're going to be 75 years old this year. Yes, yes. We'll talk about Zadig after, but uh, 75 years old this year, so congratulations. Thank you. Um, and I think about the 75 year study of happiness. So Robert Waldinger, a uh, famous author of The Good Life, one of his books is The Good Life. He is a, he's a psychologist and a professor at Harvard and he has conducted, I mean, it's an unprecedented study where you follow the life of individuals for 75 years. It hasn't been done before. And so during these questions, the, the, the one answer that has been addressed and responded the most has been how people say, looking back in their life, um, that they wished they did not spend so much time worrying about what other people thought about them. So that's this part of the study. Now thinking of this, what is your wish and what is your formula for happiness? You know what it is, you know, uh, I created my family uh, and I've achieved everything I want to do with my family, you know. I mean, I've done everything. I lived the life of a multimillionaire and I've lived the life of a pauper also at the same time, you know. Because when you're a gambler, and you're a gambler in a sense that, you know, you take chances in your life, mm -hmm. in your business, you get to see the highs and the lows, you know. I've rented a 120 feet yacht to take my kids around the Mediterranean. I've lived in beautiful houses. I've lived in a rental apartment, 400 square feet. So I, I had the taste of every uh, layer of life you can think of, you know. But I, I tried to give them the best life possible, and I've tried to achieve as much as I could this is like my, uh, uh, this last four years have been the crowning jewel of my life. That's what I call it. Why? Because you know what? All my dreams, having achieved them, it came to a point where I started thinking about my family and what my family can achieve going forward in the, I won't say last years of my life, I'm not going to be that, you know, but this is something that, you know, I could do that, you know, I can leave a legacy for them, hopefully, and I'm sure they will, they will follow my footsteps, keep my name uh, going, you know, uh, and I'll be so proud of it. And I've had a good serious talk with them, with both of them, about what I expect from them or what I hope they will do, you know. And they were so receptive and they were so, uh, and, uh, they're one of the pillars of AUA also. They made donation to AUA, you know, and you can see their names on the board. And that was a very proud moment for me, you know. And uh, uh, and having my family involved in me with what I'm doing, I can't ask for anything better, you know. I mean, people think about their retirement. Retirement time could be happy, but retirement times could be very depressing also. Mm -hmm. I have found to do something that's making me happy, that's making me exciting that take, make, keeps me busy all day long. Uh, I can't, uh, I'm a very blessed man, really blessed man. Uh, I, can't, I can't say anything. Uh. The, um, we were talking earlier a little bit about your family. I just want to point out um, for the audience to know that you're born and raised in Jerusalem and your parents, Margrit and Hovanes, um, were children of Armenian genocide survivors. And when you were telling me the story about your family, the one story that really triggered me emotionally was the story of your grandfather, your father's father, Hovannes, uh, Grigor, sorry. So Grigor, um, a man who's from Tomarza, which is the oh, part... Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Tomarza, which is the region of Gesaria in current-day Turkey. Um, very touching story because this man witnesses so he sees his entire family being shot and killed. I mean, but everybody from... I have to tell you before that about this man. About Grigor. Grigor, that in 2011, he came to Chicago. Right, in he Chicago, did. you know, in the factory. He did, and, and he returned exactly, to be to yeah. support. He returned from Chicago back to, uh, uh, to his family. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, and unfortunately, he witnesses yeah. the, the death of his entire family. I mean, there's nobody left living. Mm. Not parents, siblings, wife and children exactly, are yeah. shot, killed. So already that's a huge trauma. Yet, he marries again. Second wife with whom he has three children. And during the birth of the third child, his second wife dies during childbirth. This is the birth of your father, Hovannes. Exactly, yes, yes. 
Then he marries. With three children, he remarries again a third wife, Khatun. Mm -hmm. I mean, already just listening to this man's story, it's, it's enough to actually trigger a lot of emotions. Um, but, and it's very natural that you tell me that you recall this grandfather, Grikor, being a very silent man, very zoned out, um, no sh not showing any emotion or compassion, which is very, I think, understandable given what he's been through. And maybe your father, Hovan, is also not receiving the love because his birth mother had passed away. His father is already, you know, zoned out from, from all that he survived. Um, tell me how, how his story, specifically Grikor's story, how that resonates with you and what, how, how has that influenced you? You know, I look back to him, Grikor. He was a big man, you know, a really big man. And I always saw him like he was there sitting, but he was not there. His mind was everywhere. I would have loved to open his brain and see what he was thinking, what he was remembering. I'm sure his life has been hell on a daily basis. And sometimes, you know, like that sitting on the chair, he would, be, he would fall asleep. And as a young boy, I, I would go to my mom and said, I would say, He's dead. I think grandpa died. <laughs> They didn't made up. <laughs> uh, and he had a tough life and he's, he was a, uh, he repaired shoes. So he used to walk to a uh, village, Palestinian village, with his books, I guess, and repair shoes over there. That was his life, you know. Uh, I've never seen this man shed a tear, except when his third wife died. I saw him cry a little bit. That's the only time I saw him uh, show any uh, emotion. Emotion. Yeah. emotion. He was, a, he was like a, at that time I used to think about it, but you know, he's like, it's like a piece of rock, you know, like, you know, I mean, everybody has a little bit, but this man, what these people went through, not only him, people of that uh, age, you know, it's just, I can't even imagine, I really can't imagine, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, now that I'm a parent, I'm a father, you know, to lose your whole family, your children, it, it, there's nothing more traumatic than that. Yes, yeah. of course. And then we look at your mother's side, Margrit. Yeah. She's the middle child of 11 siblings. Her roots are from Sebastia. Exactly. And uh, very different from your father. For a force of nature. I mean, this woman from as early as you can remember was always helping others, always finding ways to help other people's lives become better from the elders at old age homes, um, I, the homeless in California, I think, when they, when you, after you guys moved there. Um, even I remember you telling me something about her visiting prisoners in jail. Yes, yes. Um, her, her passion for earthquake survivors here in Gumri and Speed Dog, after which she actually founded her foundation or organization called Love in Action. I mean, this woman was nonstop selfless, an incredibly uh, important woman in your life, as you say, one of your role models. So I'm assuming, and you can tell me what you think, I'm assuming a lot of your giving nature has come from her. Am I correct? Well, you know, it's, it's, that's what we saw growing up. It's really funny. And, you know, I look back and I said, uh, and, you know, I tell my friends, I tell people, you know, like, it's not only about money. She didn't have money. She was. She didn't have money to give to any of these people. But you know, she did the extra level of social work with them. Like she would collect people from nursing homes. I send my vans from work, bring them to my house, put them in the garden. She would set up the tables, cook food for them. She would bring a musician to play the piano for them, and then the, the kids, the young kids from the church, would serve these elderly people. And sometimes she would take them to Hollywood Bowl buy $2 tickets to sit in the rafters. And I said, Mom, I'll give you money, come forward. I said, honey, she says, music you can hear anywhere. You can be up, you can be down, you're gonna hear the same music. So I'd rather be up and uh, listen to the music. But what I'm saying is that you don't need millions of dollars to make a difference in people's lives. You can make it, you know, in different ways. And that's what, how she started, you know. And then she started her foundation. That's when she started, you know, collecting money, raising funds. I don't think with all the money I've given her, I didn't have that much at that time. Uh, she has spent one penny on herself. Every dollar I've given her, she would just spend on other people. Mm -hmm. And she was never on time in our family fun functions. And I say, mom, 
Thorne git bari tersine, Thanksgiving ye, kone zamanla ginerim, bazı kese. Tuk ammek dal olsun, rahayek, lavdun yorum eçik avrik or. Yelek keçmen tursa na etzek or, inçe vicagak mar tortsin ha. Yedi ez keçmen uşkam, yürens keçmen cevabımı goknem gor, minak bir kedes. That's me. You always, knew, you always knew when she was late for a family function, Any, she was every, somewhere helping every, somebody. Every time yeah. she was help. And I, at that time, you know, I'm a new father, I have the kids, you know, expecting my mother to be there. And she would say, you know, don't take, don't think about it, you know, I mean, I, I love you, I'll be there, I'm a little bit late, it's okay. There yeah, are other people me. that need me more yeah, than you yeah. do, you know. Very, very yeah. true. She was, I have to say also, both my parents were extremely, extremely religious, religious, extremely. Uh, <laughs> uh, and you know, growing up in Jerusalem, I have to bring this up, uh, yeah. Growing up in Jerusalem, we were very, very well grounded, you know. We didn't have any distractions, you know. My life revolved uh, at school. After school, we would go to Homendming Agumpino or Hoechmin Agumpino, play ping pong or chess. 8.30, the gates of the convent would close. We have to go home. I used to borrow books from the school library, read all night. We, the, I didn't, I didn't. About the I, yeah, fedais, that, yeah. Yeah. I didn't have distractions. We, we didn't have anything else to do. We didn't have the Starbucks. We didn't have the nightclubs. We didn't, you know. So we, we had, and then, you know, back in Jerusalem, the community itself, we didn't have very rich people. We didn't have very few people. We didn't know what rich was, what poor was, you know, we lived a normal life. You know, when I went to Lebanon, that was an eye-opening experience because, oh, wow, even the kids in my class, you know, I mean, you know, Very they're wealthy. coming in cars, they're coming in drivers. Mm -hmm. I just opened my eyes. I said, you know, there's another uh, layer of life, you know, with these people. But, you know, that, that really helped me stay grounded. Mm -hmm. uh, and... <clears throat> I, I, I didn't live in a bubble. I really didn't live in a bubble, you know. It was simple life, but I saw the values of it when I was growing up. You say values, and the first thing I think about uh, when I think of you is humility. Um, and again, it's probably because of your, your being in a grounded environment. You know, I can't think of anybody else who's been consistently humble. You treat all types of people, I mean, I'm a witness to it, whether they're very successful professionally um, or very poor or, or, or any kind of socioeconomic condition, regardless of what, uh, you treat everybody equally with love, compassion, and respect, um, whether it's in your community or even in your company, all this, you know, from the janitor to you name it. You know, these are values I find um, that, you know, f I feel have really helped you in your life. Tell me, what it takes to actually have these values. Do you, does, does somebody have to actually be born in Jerusalem under you know, very humble conditions to actually understand what these values are? Can you actually teach them or learn them? <laughs> One thing I do with any of my, I don't speak about money. I don't speak about wealth, you know. Uh, those things, they can come and go very easily also. The only thing I wish for my family to stay healthy. That's all. That's the most important thing in life. You know, my friends know me. I don't discuss uh, uh, money with them. You know, or you know where I'm living, what I'm doing. You know, those are not important things. But uh, when you're involved in good, doing good things, it just you find a different uh, face of your life. That you know, wow. You know, you're. It's not only financially also that you're making. Uh, difference in people's lives, you know. Even at work, I treat every member of my workforce, every one of them, as part of the big family. I, every morning when I go to work, I go to from office to office, say hello to everybody, I talk to them. When I see somebody who's sad, I'll bring them to my office, ask them, you know, what's wrong? There's a, some of these kids do a lot, really, you know, because some of them work, go to school, support their family. And I've established that work. We give loans to our students, to our workers. They don't have to pay any interest, and we can deduct it from their wages. And it helps them a lot, you know. Except for that girl who came and asked me three hundred and fifty thousand dollars because she was buying a house. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so you know, like we get we get together, you know, we get together to. 
and it's just like a big and you know it's a happy environment for them it's not a stressful environment for them so is it fair to say that the meaning of your life is to make a difference in everybody's life it's 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 all about that all about that i pull those kids that i see them kind of down i bring them to my office and my office is always open to them i open talk openly to them you know and I'll just tell them to go to HR and pick up a check from there and just and I've told everybody don't let it go to this stage before it gets to this come and talk to me you know a few thousand I can lend you or give you you know it's not going to make a dent in my life you know uh, and uh, I tell this to everybody at my workplace uh, and you know things happen higher no much kesin bu asfalt mış kezi bu da you know like you know the more you give the more you receive yeah. I have to tell you about this, you know, in February of this year, I got a check for $875,000 from heaven. Yeah, you I never expected it. Never expected it, never was waiting for it, you know, I didn't know what was it. So I told my son, uh, because sometimes, you know, you get fluke things, you know, you get checks and things like that. I said, call these people, find out Maybe why is this check here, here, you know, is this true? Uh, Somebody is trying to play a game with us. I, did I tell you about this? Yes, you did, but I, I, I'm curious to hear so more. So apparently, about it. you know, there was a clash action lawsuit, which I had no clue about. Nobody told me about it, and was I was part of that class action lawsuit, and my part of the loot was eight hundred and seventy-five thousand dollars. I mean, that was like when you're not expecting. Oh my God! You know, it was like you. It reminds me of the 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 concept of the law of attraction yeah. they say you attract things if you but you have to also let it go you shouldn't be thinking about these things but it will be coming to you because you attract it and it feels like you are able to attract all of this <laughs> i don't know what your trick is what the magic touches but it's working for you and i'm very very happy to hear that even when you least expect it only good things are happening and may that be the case always for you uh, uh, i'm truly uh, I'm a blessed man you know somebody is always looking after me. I really believe that, you know. Yeah. You you know, I um all, despite the good things, we're also let's be realistic, we're also surrounded by a lot of volatility. I mean, we there's so much tension and stress happening around the world. I mean, from war to earthquakes, man-made disasters, other natural disasters, we're always constantly in this process. At least I know for myself, in this very anxious state and i think I'm, i'm i try to make sense of it jack in the way where i've been born in a fragmented aura of traumas only just compounded traumas so my system is wired to always think anxiously about the next calamity or the next danger tell me how you think of this and what how you address it for you and your people your the people you care about the thing about life is that If you don't taste those stressful moments, you know, you will not appreciate the good moments. You know, you will take it for granted. It doesn't let you to take granted because you've seen the other side also. You've lived, I've gone through months where my only thought and prayer to God was, please help me get enough money so I can pay my rent, my expenses for next month. I have kids to think about. It was stressful moments, but when I had the good moments, I said, you know what? I appreciate them more because I have seen the bad part also, you know. Uh, that's that's how I uh, kind of re, uh, analyze it, mm-hmm. you know. Mm-hmm. You have to see those tough days to uh, appreciate the good days. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Fair enough. This year, apart from your 75th anniversary birthday, it'll also be the 50th wedding anniversary um, between you and Zadik. You've been together for such a long time and she's been a big part of your life. What, in what way would you say that your relationship has evolved over the years and what valuable lessons have you acquired from her uh, or in your marriage? Uh, my wife, not because she's my wife, she's an amazing woman. She's such a caring woman. You know what she does every morning? At 6.30 in the morning, she starts her calls to her friends, family members and she checks on everyone you know how they're doing are they okay the worst times for her when we had the financial disaster and so many of our friends went through tough times oh my god she was heartbroken 
So she reaches out to everybody without even me knowing, you know, if they, she can help them, she can do something for them. I've told you that I proposed to her five days after I met her, you know, and that was the best moment of my life. That has changed my life. She has stood by me and supported me in such hard times. We have been to swap meets together. Do you know what a swap meet is? No. Swap meet is a big, like, uh, yard where different vendors come and sell their wares after I was in the clothing business. And one day her dad, her father came by and said to me, Oh, Olum, you are a pharmacist, what the hell are you doing here? <laughs> but, yeah. you know, uh, we had a lot of inventory, we had to get rid of that, you know. But uh, what I'm saying is that uh, she has always backed me up in good days, bad times. She has worked with me in the pharmacy when I first opened. For years she worked with me. And uh, if I had listened to her, I would have even been, I've even done better. But she's a perfect partner for me, you know. I could have never done it. I don't say these things to her and... Uh, well, hopefully she'll hear this and she she'll be happy she, Yeah, that. but she's been amazing, you know. She, she's an amazing uh, wife, amazing mother, amazing grandmother. Yeah, I just... Uh, I'm I'll be concluding the, this conversation now, but I just want to say that, uh, Jack, every time I sit with you, every, you know, it's, you're, you're, I love your simplicity. You know, it's, you're, you don't make yourself feel higher or lower than anybody. You know, um, you, you make people feel seen, you make people feel heard. Um, it's, it's your approach to life that has just been, emitting and emulating nothing but positivity. I mean, I can't, I can't, I can never be negative sitting with you because you always have this positive vibe. You know, one thing for myself, and I would tell this to my friends also, whoever wants to listen to me is that, never measure life in uh, financial, uh, you know, leave that financial part out, you know, you know, measure people with what in their heart, what they think about themselves. You know, my friends, they're not very rich people, but they're really true friends. I know they'll be there for me at three in the morning, four in the morning. Mm -hmm. They don't ask me how much money you have or what you can, they can get out. I mean, we are such good friends and money plays no value in our friendship. Mm -hmm. And in all my relationships, I don't talk about money and I don't want to be part of that, my resume, money, you know. It's like, I want them to think about me when I die, is that, what did this guy do? Besides the financials, you know, is that, you know, what kind of heart he had, what kind of feelings he had what for example people. example did he leave I, with? And in my work also, I have to bring this also. I have supervisors, I have managers. But, you know, when I have group meeting with all of them, I said, you know what, in my eyes, every one of you part of this company. I don't have managers, supervisors. The the janitor has much value for this company as the supervisor has. If this guy doesn't clean the building, you're going to stay in a dirty building. Mm -hmm. So uh, I don't measure people by how much money they have, you know, it's just, you know, what kind of good heart they have, you know, that's, that's, the, that's the most important part. Well, I mean, I, I only wish you endless health uh, because the work that you're doing is incredible, even when people least expect it, especially when I think about the, the children uh, with the co-op center and the scholarship funds and all the children you've been touching their lives with, um, whether it's in higher education or just school children, I just want to say thank you so much for what you're doing. Wishing you nothing but great health with you, Zadik, together and your family, your extended family. Um, I look forward to seeing you again. Thank you. thank you so much, Laura. Really, it was fun and enjoyable to sit down with you, you know. Uh, you guys are all amazing people here, you know. It's, I'm so proud to know you, you know. Amazing people. Uh, this was fun. Yeah. yeah this was fun. <laughs> Thank uh, you very much, Jack. Uh, Thank you fun. so much.